So today we're going to look at learning and neuroplasticity and some of the basic concepts behind these terms and specifically ask the question topic for tonight is the misbehavior of organisms or why we do stupid things. And first I'd like to start with a clinical example. And I have to say, when I give clinical examples, I usually change some details. So it doesn't really, uh, affect confidentiality for patients that I see or things that I read online. So this is sort of a, uh, composite of a couple of people that I'm working with, but here's the example. This is a person who writes, uh, they're trying to regain control. And a person says, I'm so disappointed in myself. I was doing well using now Trexone before drinking until I eventually stopped drinking completely. One day at a wedding, when everyone else was toasting the couple, I absentmindedly took a, a sip of champagne. I wound up having four or five glasses of wine that night. Soon after, I started, it started a string of daily binges, each time following by emotional crashes and deep regret. Each morning, I start today by taking naltrexone and vowing not to drink that day, but by late afternoon, I'm drinking again. I don't even enjoy the alcohol and wonder what is wrong with me. My husband is angry with me and is giving up on me, and I don't blame him. I feel helpless and hopeless that I'll never escape AUD. Why did I have that glass of champagne without now? Why was I so stupid? I don't feel in control. I feel lost and miserable and angry that I put myself back there, back here. And worse, I don't know how to pull myself back up. So when <clears throat> people write these sorts of things or talk to me about these sorts of things, they, they ask the question why, but it's more stated like, why the blank did I do that? More in a blaming way, as opposed to what we're going to try to accomplish this semester in terms of asking the question, I'm curious, why do I act and feel that way? And I have to say, I like this quote by Matt Damon from the movie, The Martian. In the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm going to have to science the shit out of this. And that's what we're going to do for this person, science the shit out of it, try to understand why the person had the... Uh, experience that they had and what we can do to help them. And I want to say by introduction that for this semester, the plan is not just to present facts to you, but to help share some tools to help understand addiction and the scientific mechanisms that underlie addiction. We're going to challenge the myth, learn the science of how we get addicted and unaddicted. And from the tools that we learn, it's going to give you a chance to exercise author uh, agency so you can take control of your own recovery process. And then I hope once you learn these tools that you can give back, you can teach others these tools and help spread the word about this approach to understanding and treating addiction. In medicine, we have a term for learning new skills, which is see one, do one, teach one. And what I like to do for this seminar is to encourage you to learn it, do it, and teach it. And the reason Steve and I are putting together this seminar is that we believe that in order to overcome sort of the traditional approach to treating addictions, that it's important to help educate and, and mobilize a grassroots effort to overcome the inertia of the current flawed treatment approach and to make science-based treatment the preferred option. Let me just recap a little bit from the first meetup and how it relates to today's session. And the basic thesis from last week was to understand what is alcohol addiction. And, and the conclusion was that it's really a concept that we look at along three dimensions. And the first dimension 
is the notion of impaired control, which I believe is the cardinal feature of what makes something addictive. And that includes items such as craving, difficulty cutting back or controlling how much you drink, and then spending a lot of time involved with alcohol or recovering from its effects. So there's impaired control. And often with impaired control comes psychosocial consequences. The failure to take care of responsibilities at home or at work. Continued use despite medical and psychosocial complications from alcohol. And there's little time and energy left over for other tasks, social work and recreational activities. And the other criteria is that alcohol is used in dangerous situations such as drunk driving. And then over time, your body adapts to alcohol. And that's manifested by either tolerance, where there's less pharmacological effect of alcohol if, if you take the same dose, or withdrawal, that when you stop using alcohol, you get classic alcohol withdrawal symptoms. And I think these three dimensions are well represented by the phrase, the drink takes a drink, the drink takes the person, and then the person needs the drink. And one, one of the things that we, you and I talked about, Joe, on that particular slide was that those three dimensions, they don't happen necessarily in a linear fashion, but they all start to manifest themselves. And as a person starts to look at those three buckets, if you will, they can get a better feel as to where they might be placed on the um, spectrum, the alcohol use disorder spectrum, because it is a spectrum, not a line in the sand, as we discussed last week. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. That it's not a dichotomy. It's not an either or, but it's a it's a spectrum. It's it's uh, the severity can be very mild or it can be very severe. And it's important that there are some people, especially from certain drugs, that you can get more physiologic adaptation without much in the way of psychosocial consequences or impaired control. For example, someone who's using uh, opiates for uh, pain control might find that they have tolerance and withdrawal to the opiates, but it's not necessarily uh, uh, affecting uh, the rest of their life. And they wouldn't say that they have impaired control because they're taking the medicines as their doctor prescribes. And you can have some people who don't have impaired control, but um, you know they're 21 and they go to a party and they have a DUI after drinking a lot, but they don't have the other characteristics of impaired control or physiologic adaptation. So you don't, it doesn't necessarily follow that A causes B causes C, but this is often a typical pattern that for people with addiction, that it's the impaired control that over time leads to psychosocial consequences. And over time, the body adapts to the effect of the alcohol. And this represents the uh, addictive cycle, which I think is the cardinal feature of what makes something addictive. And that is that a, a person will use drug or alcohol, and you may feel good or get relief from negative symptoms. And then as the alcohol or drug wears off, you go through withdrawal, and that withdrawal increases the motivation to use again. And it establishes a pattern where use causes increased motivation for more use. And to treat addiction, you must break the cycle. And we looked at sort of traditional versus non-traditional approaches to addiction treatment. And the traditional approach is uh, people view addiction as a chronic or incurable disease. Um, and often it's related to some defect in the person. And there's two general models about this. One is that the defect is in the person's character. And the other is there, there's some biological defect, typically in a person's brain. Again, the notion is that it's incurable. And the only way that it can be managed is with complete abstinence or using a medication like methadone or buprenorphine, which is an agonist medicine, which helps reduce the complications of the addiction, but the person is, still has a physical dependence on a drug. And the notion is treatment is lifelong, that you either go to meetings for the rest of your life or you stay on methadone or buprenorphine for the rest of your life. But the, the concept here is that the traditional approach to addiction treatment is that it's a chronic disorder and treatment needs to be long-lasting, long if not forever. 
the non-traditional approach to treating addiction is that there's many shades of addiction, as you pointed out, that it's not a dichotomy, but it's a continuum, a spectrum. And of course, can be variable depending on where you are on that spectrum. That addiction is a learned behavior and behaviors can be unlearned through extinction. And the recovery doesn't have to be a lifelong uh, uh, treatment, but you can recover and be free of the addiction. You, you, the, that there is a a place you can be where the addiction no longer assumes an important place in your life. So let's look at neuroplasticity and learning. And it's important to keep in mind that the brain influences the behavior, but the behavior also influences. The brain, it can cause structural changes in the brain. And, and I'm fond of this quote from an article in uh, 2021, which says that from the research, the findings suggest that behavioral experience and brain development are interactive. Bidirectional processes, such as that experiences shapes future changes in the brain, and the brain shapes future behavioral changes. Moreover, these interactions varied as a function of the child's age and brain region, highlighting the importance of a developmental perspective when investigating brain behavior interactions. And how does it do this? Well, the nervous system shows several kinds of neuroplasticity at various levels. For example, there's the level at the, uh, the, the site of the um, receptors. <clears throat> And actually, that's where a medicine like naltrexone can interact, right at the receptor level. And then neurons, which have multiple receptors on them, can in turn be influenced over time. And then various neurons can uh, bind together in terms of networks in the brain. And so you can have neuroplastic changes within uh, networks, within individual neurons, or within a particular uh, receptor system. So neuroplasticity across occurs across various levels of neurobiology. And so what causes some of the structural brain changes? So for example, maturation is clearly one of those that over time your brain matures and it causes various functional changes so that, for example, at a very early age, you can learn language very easily. But as you get older, it's more difficult to learn language. Exposure to toxins can cause brain changes, physical trauma, strokes, lack of oxygen, metabolic deficiencies, including um, vitamin deficiencies, inflammation, uh, tumors, drugs. But what I want to stress here is that the other thing that can cause changes to the brain involves learning. And that's something that we can control and manipulate. So when people talk about that it's a brain disease, it's important to keep in mind that through learning, we can change the brain. So what are some of the mechanisms of learning? And um, for the today's uh, meetup, I like to talk about instrumental learning, which is often called operant learning or Skinnerian learning. It's all the same thing, instrumental learning. There's classical conditioning, which is all, often called Pavlovian conditioning. And then I want to mention something about the interactions between classical conditioning and instrumental learning. And we probably won't get to it today, but then there's also learning to learn or meta-learning. Maybe we'll bring that up at one of the other meetups. So what's instrumental learning? The typical instrumental learning paradigm that I think we're familiar with is the situation where you have a rat that's been deprived of food for some period of time. So it goes into a, a cage, so often it's called a Skinner box. And um, it randomly walks around the cage and then will randomly hit a, for example, a lever. And then when the lever is activated, it delivers food pellets to the animal. And over time, the animal, the rat typically learns to press a lever to get food pellets. So that's an example where pressing a lever causes some positive outcome. And when that occurs, we call that positive reinforcement. 
you can also have instrumental learning in which we call it negative reinforcement in which um, when a, an organism is some bad state and it does something to help relieve that bad state. So in a typical experiment, the, the uh, rat might be experiencing uh, you know, electric foot shocks and when it hits the lever, the foot shocks uh, stop. And so the behavior is reinforced by the removal of something negative. So we call that negative reinforcement. And then there's punishment in which when an organism makes a response, some bad event occurs. So it's contingent upon some bad, uh, bad outcome. And we won't talk too much about schedules of reinforcement tonight, but we'll spend some time talking about extinction. And that's used by the Sinclair method to treat AUD. And that's where the behavior is no longer followed by the outcome. So here's another way to look at it that is something something bad could happen or something good can happen contingent upon some behavior. And so if a person receives something bad, we call that positive we call that positive punishment and the behavior is weakened, it's less likely to occur. When something good happens and you give something good to, to a behavior, that's called positive reinforcement and the behavior is strengthened. And again, negative reinforcement is when you take away something bad, that also strengthens the behavior. And when something good is taken away, <clears throat> we call that negative punishment and behavior is weakened. So that's instrumental learning. The other major kind of learning is called classical conditioning or Pavlovian conditioning. And the basic paradigm looks like this, that you have a situation where you present some unconditioned stimulus and a typical paradigm, it's something like food. You present that to a dog, an organism, and a dog salivates. And it does that, that's a reflexive response to receiving food. And we call the food, the unconditioned stimulus and salivation, the unconditioned response. Now, in the experiment, you, you show that a whistle is a neutral stimulus. So you present the whistle to the dog and there's no salivation, no conditioned response. And then you present this neutral stimulus, the whistle with food, and you have many pairings of the whistle and food present it together, and the dog salivates. And after many pairings of this, you can present the whistle alone, and a dog will salivate, and there's no food involved. So that's a conditioned response. So the whistle becomes a conditioned stimulus, and salivation in response to the whistle is the conditioned response. And then it's important to keep in mind that for classical conditioning, you can also have extinction, just like you can for instrumental learning. And the way you do this is you present a conditioned stimulus without presenting the unconditioned stimulus. So that might be an example of you walking into a bar and not getting any alcohol. The bar is the conditioned stimulus because it's been paired with, say, drinking. But if you and getting the effect from the alcohol. But if you just walk into a bar and you don't drink, that would be an extinction trial. And what we see is that over time, the condition response diminishes. So if you walk into a bar and you don't drink, the, for example, the craving might be the condition response. That will get less and less the more you walk into a bar and not drink. But it's also important to keep in mind that for classical conditioning, you can have a phenomenon called spontaneous recovery. And that's the return of the condition re response if the condition stimulus is reintroduced after a period of no activity. So for example, let's say the person uh, works at a bar and has been working there for two months and now walks into a bar uh, where they're working and no longer experiences any craving. But now they quit their job and they haven't been in a bar for four or five months, and then they walk into a bar again for the first time after several months, you might find that the craving comes back. 
So even though something appears to be extinguished, it can show spontaneous recovery if it hasn't been presented in a while and then it's suddenly presented. And so this slide shows an example of that, that if you pair a metronome with, which is a CS, with food, unconditioned stimulus, you get the conditioned response. And that shows how over time, if you measure salivation, it increases with, with an increased number of trials. And then if you present the metronome without the food, <clears throat> eventually the conditioned stimulus then loses its power to elicit salivation so that it's extinction and that occurs over time. But then if you bring the dog back into the experimental chamber the next day, 24 hour rest, and then present the metronome, even though it was extinguished the day before, when you first present the metronome again, there's some spontaneous recovery. Then if you do that over several days, you'll find spontaneous recovery becomes less and less. So what's the difference between classical conditioning and operant conditioning? <clears throat> In classical conditioning, um, the response, the condition response is reflexive. It's involuntary. It doesn't involve any uh, willful behavior on the part of the person or the animal. There's just a conditioned stimulus and an involuntary response. But for operant conditioning, there's a voluntary response and some consequence. So the rat has the option of pressing the bar or not pressing the bar. So one is involuntary and the other is voluntary. And now I'd like to talk a little bit more about neurobiology. And so one of the things that's really important to understand with, with uh, addictions is the interplay between the emotional brain and the prefrontal cortex. The, the limbic brain is the more the emotional brain, the, um, we will call it the reptilian brain and the prefrontal cortex is our sort of our logical brain and the prefrontal cortex is involved with things like decision-making, reasoning and logic, forward thinking and instrumental learning and things that we might call willpower. The limbic brain deals more with feelings and emotions, with motivation, with immediate rewards, with classical conditioning. And we would say it's more reflexive or hardwired. So here's another way of looking at that. Instrumental learning, prefrontal cortex, decision-making, reasoning and logic, forward thinking, willpower, and classical conditioning, the limbic system, feelings and emotions, motivation, immediate rewards, reflexive. Oops, there we go. <clears throat> and so for classical conditioning, it's a learning process that occurs by linking a neutral stimulus with a biologically important stimulus to produce a new learned response. And Instrumental conditioning is a learning process that occurs by linking behavior and the consequences for that behavior. And the main difference is that classical conditioning involves involuntary behavior, whereas instrumental learning involves voluntary behavior. Now, at this point, you might say, well, that's a very nice introduction to learning and classical conditioning and instrumental learning, but how is this relevant to addictions? Well, if we look at a medicine like naltrexone, where does that act? So typically we think of naltrexone as blocking the reward associated with drinking. So it blocks the endorphins, limits dopamine, and it limits the reward for drinking. So by pressing the lever um, and you, uh, the person walks into a bar, drinks alcohol, if they have naltrexone in their system, they're not going to get the endorphin effect, the reward from endorphins for drinking the alcohol. So that would produce an extinction trial. But naltrexone also works to block the compulsion to drink. That if you present a stimulus that's been paired with drinking 
and you have naltrexone on board, it turns out that the conditioned stimulus doesn't, doesn't elicit the conditioned response or the craving. So in that way, the naltrexone can block the craving. So it can help with the extinction of con the conditioned stimulus. So it has two effects, two important effects. And now I want to get to the misbehavior of organisms. And I have to say that, you know, in working sometimes with patients or and listening to patients, one of the things that I hear all the time is that people feel frustrated that why do they keep making the same mistake? Or why do they do things sort of impulsively without thinking about them? And when I hear the story, it reminds me of uh, when I was a undergraduate and I worked with a fellow named Larry Engberg and we worked with pigeons. And let me tell you the first experiment. So we would have pigeons and I would have to train them to um, peck at a lit key to get the access to food. And uh, I found that if I just presented the uh, lit the key for five seconds and then delivered food, it was very easy to train the birds to peck the key to get food. And that was, this is called auto shaping. But this fella, uh, David Williams at Penn did an interesting experiment where he set the conditions that, are, that were a little bit different. He would have the key light come on and then after five seconds, a food the hopper would come up and the pigeon would have access to food. But to get the food, the pigeon had to refrain from pecking the key. So all the pigeon had to do is not peck the key and they would have access to food. And what he found was that many pigeons couldn't help themselves. They would still go over and peck the key and lose access to food. So the person, the, the, the pigeon in this case was acting uh, not in their best interest, was acting, we would say, stupidly. And, and my uh, thesis, my advisor at the time, Larry Engberg, would say, well, that's pigeons. You know, they're, they're, they're bird brained. They're not very smart, smart organisms. They're, they're, they're pretty dumb. But one of the things that we found was that this sort of process of being able to refrain from acting toward a stimulus to to uh, uh, get your reward occurred in a variety of organisms. And so there was a big experiment bun, done by uh, the Brelins who were training um, animals to, um, to be in uh, TV commercials. And so, for example, one animal, they were training pigs to pick up a coin to put in a piggy bank. And they, they thought that would be a cute demonstration. And they could train the pig to do that. And the pig would pretty reliably uh, put a uh, coin in his mouth and go over and put it in the piggy bank and then get access to food. But after a while, the pig stopped doing that. They would get the coin, put it in their mouth and they wouldn't bring it over to the piggy bank. They would just sort of root at it all the time. And they acted to the coin as if it was food. So that looked bad. So they wrote this classic paper called The Misbehavior of Organisms. And they said, you know, this is where instrumental con uh, conditioning doesn't work anymore. Instrumental learning breaks down. So is the pigeon irrational? Are they really bird brains? Or is there something else going on? Well, it turns out, if we think about it, that in the process of instrumental learning, there's also classical conditioning that's occurring. So when, a, when you put a rat in a Skinner box and give them the chance to press a lever to get food, you're also pairing the Skinner box with getting food. Or looking at the bar, it becomes paired with food. So the bar becomes a conditioned stimulus for food. So this setting can act as a conditioned stimulus and a conditioned stimulus can elicit a conditioned response. So there's two things going on when you do instrumental learning. You, you train the behavior, 
with an outcome, but you also establish the setting as a condition stimulus and you get a condition response. And the condition response can interact with the instrumental behavior. Now, sometimes the condition response can help with the instrumental behavior. So when I did the regular auto shaping experiment, pressing the key, the lit key, helped train the birds to press the key to get the pellet of food. But that's because the key, the condition res response for food for a pigeon is to peck at it. So it made it easy to train the pigeon to do that. But when I set it to uh, the negative auto shaping that the pigeon had to refrain from pecking the key, he couldn't do it because the condition response was to peck the key. The instrumental response was to do anything but peck the key so that to compete it with each other. And sometimes the condition response would win out and the pigeon would lose access to food, would act irrationally. And sometimes the condition response can act to increase one's motivational state. So for example, when I go to a restaurant, <clears throat> after I have a full meal, I'm pretty full and you know, I might go to the restaurant hungry, but when I eat, my motivation to eat decreases over time because I've had a nice full meal and I'm done eating. I really don't need to eat anymore. And then when a waiter comes around and asks, do you want something for dessert? I'll say, no, thank you. And then the waiter will then pull out a dessert tray and say, well, here are the desserts for tonight. And then I'll look at the desserts and the desserts become a conditioned stimulus for me. And that elicits craving that increases my motivation to want to have dessert. And so these processes of instrumental learning, of classical conditioning, and how they interact that's somehow lost in terms of our regular way of discussing behavior. But the people who know these principles best are advertisers. They know how to affect people's behavior and they're using these principles to influence your behavior. You know, people talk about instrumental learning and say, well, that's nice, but you know, that doesn't really affect me very much. And I would say, not a, that's not true. Just things like, um, on social media, getting an up arrow when you make a comment, that's a positive reinforcement and very powerful, very powerful. So powerful that maybe some people can even get addicted to social media. So these things are going on all the time in commercials and advertising. They understand these principles really well. And the important point here is that what appears to be irrational is really a conflict between two kinds of learning, instrumental learning, which is voluntary, and classical conditioning, which is involuntary. Now, so how does this apply? Well, I'm sorry, before we even get to that, I wanna make one other point. And that is that if you look, if you give somebody the option of doing something that affects the limbic brain and you say, how much do you want this uh, positive thing? You find that if it's available right away, the emotional brain says, I want that. But if you say, I'll give it to you in an hour, the value of it goes down quite a bit, goes down very quickly. So we call the reinforcement gradient a steep decline. But for things that affect the cognitive brain, we're more likely to look at its value now and its value over time. And it tends to hold its value better. And uh, one way I, I, I think about this is that um, when I <clears throat> do something that uh, that is in my long-term best interest, like I need to wake up early tomorrow so I can put in a full day of work or play or whatever, when the event is, you know, eight hours away, my logical brain, my my cognitive brain says it's good to wake up early, so I set my alarm clock. But then when my alarm clock goes off, so now the event is right here, right now, 
uh, the alarm clock, my uh, emotional brain says, just hit the snooze button. So what's happening is when the event occurs shortly, the emotional brain has a stronger vote than the cognitive brain. But if I'm trying to decide something out for eight hours, the cognitive brain has a stronger vote than the emotional brain. So that's a very important concept to keep in mind. So this has to be instrumental learning, classical conditioning. Okay. And now, how do we apply all these concepts to help this person trying to regain control? How do we understand this person's behavior? So typically, you know, in uh, social media, when someone writes something like this, maybe before today's lecture, you would say, just hang in there. Uh, you know, you'll get better. I remember that uh, uh, I went through the same sort of thing, but over time, things got better. But how would you respond to this person now? And I'd be curious to to get some feedback from people. And maybe, Steve, you can you can give me some ideas of how, how what would you say to this person now? How would you break down what they're saying here in terms of some of the concepts that we've talked about? Well, I think one of the things that really stands out to me is this whole idea of context. Okay, so I think it would be one of the things that would be important is to understand that context. Okay, uh, in this particular instance, I believe, if I remember correctly, it was a wedding. And the action was getting a glass of champagne and toasting and drinking it before even thinking about it. And so that really is a conditioned response and has been so deeply ingrained that it's become automatic. And so it isn't something that the person thought about premeditated or um, did on purpose. It happened as a result of the set and the setting and um, the resulting consequence that the person is putting themselves through is really it's inappropriate with respect to the action that was taken so yeah they're, so they're they're punishing themselves for a a active response when it was an automatic response yeah exactly right so a lot of times when people <clears throat> Uh, think about drinking, they think of it in terms of it's an instrumental learning, it's under voluntary control, and particularly cravings, you know, that you, you should be able to not have craving if, after you've undergone behavioral extinction, for example. So this person used uh, now, uh, extinguished their behavior so that they weren't drinking anymore, and they probably in their mind assumed, well, I, I'm recovered, I'm fine. But the context, going to a wedding is maybe something she had experienced very much of. Um, and, and so the wedding, the context had not extinguished, or even if it did, maybe there'd be spontaneous recovery because a person doesn't go to weddings very often. And so the condition uh, stimulus of being at the wedding and getting a uh, champagne glass in your hand may have stimulated um craving for the alcohol and just the reflexive response of drinking it. So it wasn't something that the person did volitionally. It was something that happened involuntarily. And then of course, what happens if you have one drink and you don't have now trucks on board that can easily turn into four or five glasses of wine. So that's the typical pattern of addiction. So what happened that night is not surprising. And it's not something to beat yourself over, right? We can understand what may have happened to cause that. And then, of course, after one episode of drinking, it led to a string of daily binges. <clears throat> and the one day of drinking turned into weeks of drinking. And then again, the person is still blaming themselves for why they can't stop. 
So the person at some point will say, I don't even enjoy the alcohol. And I wonder what's wrong with me. My hung, uh, husband is angry with me and giving up on me and I don't blame him. So again, people are looking at this as some sort of volitional behavior. And the person is willfully engaged in this excessive drinking as if it's something that they can, they're doing it on purpose. But as we understand it, that maybe over time, the person is even getting some physiologic adaptation to the alcohol. And even though they're not getting positive reinforcement from the alcohol anymore, they may be getting negative reinforcement that if they don't drink, they might go through withdrawal. And so the alcohol drinking is giving them negative reinforcement because it's taking away the withdrawal symptoms. So the person begins to find that they're out of control and they feel that they have nothing to do. So what advice would you give the person now? Well, <laughs> that's a really good question and a really loaded question. Um, it, it depends on whether they're actually taking naltrexone or something to help them with cravings. So we would start with that and see if they are using some sort of uh, medication to help them with that. And then also look at the adjunct therapies that they might be um practicing or not practicing one thing that jumps out at me as i think about this particular example is that i think a lot of people i know i would have fallen into this situation where i would have thought that that behavior at that wedding was something that was within my control and then when some other people tell me that I have disappointed them by acting in a way that was not appropriate or whatever. Um, it's compounded because I'm already thinking that it was something that I did on purpose. Okay. So I can't even defend my, myself against myself. Um, so I think a really important lesson here is to understand the cases where it really is out of your control. I think equally important, though, too, is to not allow that to become too runaway and say, well, none of this is in my control. OK, I have no responsibility for any of this. And I think that that's where we when we talk about, OK, so we're going to introduce medication here to help with uh, cravings. And then we're going to introduce processes to unlearn the behavior. Um one of the things that you and I have discussed is really the importance of understanding the difference between instrumental learning and classical conditioning, not so much just to be able to answer a question on a quiz, but to be able to examine our own actions and say, which one of these really are kind of in my control and could be more in my control if I learned how to take more control of those and which of those are so automatic that we now have to go through some deconditioning so that I can um, not have that automatic response and what does that deconditioning look like? Long answer to your question. <laughs> yeah, no, I, no, I agree. And uh <clears throat> It, it It is important to sort of shine a light and begin to analyze the behavior and ask yourself, is this a, a, an example of I, I wanted to drink, I logically thought about it and I thought it would be a good idea or something that um, I did it reflexively, I didn't think about it. Um, am I drinking to get the positive effects of the alcohol or am I drinking to take away negative effects? So you begin to dissect the situation and that gives you different strategies for uh, approaching it. If you're drinking to take away the um, negative reinforcement, so you're willfully using it because I know if I don't drink, I'm going to have bad withdrawal. So I'm going to use the alcohol as a way of avoiding withdrawal. That would be an example of instrumental learning. And you're doing it volitionally to avoid the withdrawal. Now, we might say there may be other strategies to deal with the withdrawal, because if you drink to, if you use alcohol as a way of taking away the alcohol withdrawal symptoms, then you're just going to create conditions where you're going to have withdrawal tomorrow. So maybe there's other strategies to take away the withdrawal besides redosing on alcohol. For someone who 
uh, finds that they're disappointed that um, they go into situations and all of a sudden their craving is high. Again, maybe you can treat that from a uh, pharmacologic way by using naltrexone and that may be successful in blocking the condition response. Or over time, you have enough extinction trials and you even worry about spontaneous recovery. So that, that might be something to be especially vigilant about, but you can undergo uh, extinction of condition stimuli. So if a person hadn't been to a wedding for a while, that might be something to be vigilant about, that that might be a, a bad situation. Now, if someone's been to many weddings and haven't, hasn't any craving, then you're probably in pretty good shape that you won't have craving in that situation. So rather than spend a lot of energy blaming yourself, getting down on yourself, feeling hopeless, giving up, it's important to dissect the situation and try to understand what are the conditions going on here? Where is instrumental learning? Where's classical conditioning? Where are these two things interacting? And that gives you some strategies for how to fix it. Yeah. And what, one thing I will say is I got very confused <laughs> myself, you know, just the, what's it's referred to as instrumental learning or Skinnerian learning and then classical conditioning. And it all gets kind of jumbled up. Okay. Because each sounds like the other in, in ways. Okay. So what I would just tell folks is that we will keep revisiting these definitions again and again and again to try to make them simpler and easier to understand. And maybe we'll even oversimplify them to some extent, just so that we really get a good foundation in this because the foundation is so important to what Joe just said. Once we really understand the various avenues that we can go down, then we can start really looking at our behaviors and saying, which way am I going? And if I am going that way, what are the possible solutions to that? So um, if, if, if it sounds a little daunting right now, by the end of eight weeks or so from now, you will have this stuff burned in your brain. All righty. Let's see. So by coming attractions, I want to introduce the idea that uh, looking at opponent opposing forces in terms of trying to understand why certain things, certain activities, certain drugs lead to addiction. And we'll talk ab uh, about that maybe next uh, session. But let me um, stop the presentation and uh, see if there's questions and we can address some of people's questions. We, we absolutely have some questions. So I'm right. going to tee some folks up. Uh, I think first was Beth. Uh, Beth had some questions uh, about the interaction, uh, specifically towards drinking through the now. So I'm going to ask Beth to unmute if I can do that. <laughs> Let's see. There's Beth. Oh, yeah, you unmuted me, but I I pretty much wrote the question straight up, and it's it's the heart of the discussion, really. Okay, and it's, you know, the intersection of behavior and medicine. Um, you know, for and I see this a lot in our in our uh, TSM chats, right? When people talk about drinking through the medicine, so so how is it? You know, how to uh, impact behavior uh, modification so that the medicine can do its job, right? Because the medicine itself. Mm -hmm. The science of it, you know, in and of itself isn't always enough. I hope I explained it well enough, but if you have any clarification questions, I can respond. You want to take a crack at it or would you like me to to address that? I'll let you take a crack at it. Um, but I think that the idea is that when a person finds themselves in the situation where they're drinking through the now, okay, um, that they're chasing the buzz, even though the now track zone should be doing its job. One of the approaches is to increase the redose at that point, or maybe even take a higher dosage in the beginning. Uh, another would be to stop okay or change the behavior so i think where best question is 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 trying to really understand um you know when you get into that situation how do you start to dissect it as you said to look at it as 
from a biological versus a psychosocial standpoint. Yes. Yeah. So if someone says that they're drinking through taking naltrexone, there's a couple of questions I would ask. And one would be when you drink, um, do, what kind of effect do you get from drinking? So some people will say, uh, after I have five or six drinks, I can still get a nice buzz. Then I'll ask them, how's your energy level? And people who say they have increased energy and a nice buzz, then I know the naltrexone has not been effective in reducing the endorphin-dopamine effect. And then I will ask them, when do you take the naltrexone? And often I'll find answers like, I took the naltrexone in the morning. And then I'll say, when did you drink? And they'll say, they drank in the evening. And then I'll say, it's likely you're one of those quick metabolizers of naltrexone. And it's better for you to take naltrexone more in the later afternoon so that you can get a good therapeutic dose of the naltrexone to help block the effect of alcohol giving you that nice euphoria and that high. So that's one way it could go. Another way is the person might say, I drink, but I don't get a high even when, you know, I, I have five or six drinks and I still don't get a high from it. And I'll say, how do you feel? And they might just say, I feel tired or relaxed or whatever. And so there, the instrumental behavior might be reinforced because of negative reinforcement. And I'll ask them, I say, do you drink every day? And if they say they're a daily drinker, they drink every day at six o'clock in the evening when they're preparing dinner. And then I say, well, what would happen if you didn't drink? And they might say, I don't know, I just wouldn't feel right. And then when I dissect, it usually comes down to that they might feel more irritable or anxious. And when they drink alcohol, they feel more calmer, they'll say. And what really is happening is that they're going through some withdrawal. And by drinking the alcohol, it takes away that unpleasant feeling of the alcohol withdrawal. So then the behavior is reinforced through negative reinforcement. You're taking away a bad feeling. Now, Trexone is not particularly helpful for reducing negative reinforcement. So I would ask if there's some strategies that we can use to deal with the negative, with the negative effect, uh, the craving or whatever, the withdrawal symptoms you have without using alcohol. And so I might offer something like uh, a, one of the detox medicines, and we can spend more time talking about various medicines to help with alcohol withdrawal symptoms. Um, and then there's some people who might say, no, I don't have withdrawal and no, um, uh, I don't get the high. And when I talk to them, uh, they'll say things like, uh, I drink because, uh, uh, my husband thinks I shouldn't drink and, uh, he's not going to tell me what to do. And so I'm going to drink. And the, there, the positive reinforcement is I'm getting back at my husband. So th there's a variety of reasons that, that people can use. And, and some people just say, I don't understand it. But when you dissect it, it usually comes down to things that are related to some sort of reward, either a positive reward or we will call it negative reinforcement or negative reward or related to uh, how classical conditioning can elicit craving. And so by, the, by drinking, the person relieves their craving. And so usually we can break it down in that way and we understand it better and then we can address the issue. Well, it does it really help you if you drink and show your husband that he can't control you. Is there other ways you can deal with that issue? And, and that's where some of the psychosocial approaches can come in that the person can learn, well, I really don't need the alcohol to do that. I can just tell him straight up, you know, you know, I'm uh, my own self and uh, you can't tell me what to do. And, but I'm not going to have to prove it by drinking the alcohol. I can prove it in other ways. So there's a variety of approaches. So it's important to dissect the issue as opposed to sometimes you just get so frustrated and say, you know, why do I do it? You know, what's wrong with me? And then you just get in a vicious cycle of getting down on yourself. And then sometimes when people are down on themselves, then they drink to not feel so crappy about themselves. So you can get stuck in that kind of vicious cycle where the response you give yourself just creates the need to have to drink more alcohol to take away that crappy feeling. So I hope, I hope that helps answers the question. I think it does. Um, 
I'm going to go to Jennifer now, who has a question with respect to trauma. Um, Jennifer, I have the question in the chat. I can read it, or I'm going to ask you to unmute if you care to pose it yourself. Sure. Sure. First of all, thank you for this information. It's really helpful. Um, uh, my question is um, just curious. We, you talked about the brain and the different areas of the brain and what they do. And I'm wondering if drinking has an impact on the changes in the brain. Um, I heard that abuse or trauma can cause the brain, the prefrontal cortex of the brain to shrink, having some things like short-term memory. And I'm just wondering, you know, if there's changes when we're drinking and also if people are more susceptible to addiction, if they've been in through abuse or trauma. Well, uh, that's a, a great question. And, you know, that's something that I think we'll take up at one of the, the future meetups, the whole idea okay. of trauma and drinking. So, but let me give you the a short answer now, and I can give you a more detailed uh, answer later. But it certainly is the case that trauma can lead to increases in alcohol drinking. Um, the way I got into this field to begin with was the uh, the veteran that I saw who was in Vietnam, and uh, he was exposed to a, a lot of trauma while in Vietnam. And when he came back to the States, uh, he felt awful. He had nightmares. And then when he drank, he had some temporary relief of those symptoms. Um, the way I got rats to drink in my original experiments, uh, you know, many years ago was I exposed them to uncontrollable trauma. And I found that the rats who had the uncontrollable trauma, trauma often, uh, they, they tended to increase their alcohol drinking versus rats who had no trauma or controllable trauma. So, Trauma is another way to get to uh, uh, excessive drinking. So one would be certain people have a genetic predisposition that when they drink, they get a big burst of uh, endorphins when they drink. And there's other people who get there through trauma, that the trauma itself can increase endogenous opiates. And when the trauma goes away, the person can go through the equivalent of withdrawal from their own endogenous opiates. And at that point, the alcohol can hit the spot. Um, it's interesting. I, I work with people who've been exposed to trauma a lot. And uh, one of the things that's interesting is when I talk to people, I find that uh, even though they've been exposed to the trauma, you would think they would try to avoid it at all costs. But Often in their behavior, they sort of put themselves in traumatic situations again. Mm -hmm. And it, again, it's one of those things that doesn't seem to make sense unless you think of it in terms of for people who are in withdrawal from their own endogenous opiates, re-exposure to the trauma actually sort of feels good a little bit. And again, what seems to be irrational, why would someone put themselves in dangerous situations again, becomes more rational. I remember working with veterans who uh, they were miserable, but then they, in group therapy, they would talk about some of their traumatic experiences. And instead of necessarily being stressed about it, they seemed to feel better. Uh, and it wasn't just being a cathartic talking about the experiences that, that they physically felt better. And uh, I've had other veterans who um, would engage in, you know, uh, war games. They would hang out with their buddies and, and do, do things, and you would expect that they would try to avoid it, but instead there was a certain part of them that sort of put themselves back in that situation, and it didn't make sense, except that it stimulates these uh, the dopamine and endorphins again and, and gives them some relief from their symptoms. So that's something to keep in mind. So there, it's, it's a whole big area of interesting research, and sometimes things seem completely paradoxical unless you understand the underlying mechanisms involved. You also ask, what about structural changes? How does trauma cause structural changes in the brain? And there's tons of data to show that that's true. So in addition to endogenous opiates that are released during uncontrollable stress, cortisol is released. 
and other neurotransmitters are released and inflammatory responses are released. And you can see actually compensatory changes in the brain where they're shrinking in certain areas and sensi increased sensitivity in other areas. And so we'll learn about the amygdala and how that can get sensitized with exposure to trauma, how things in the hippocampus involved with memory can shrink with exposure to trauma. So there's a lot of important biological effects in the brain that are a result of a behavioral factor. Exposure to trauma causes structural changes in the brain. And what about alcohol and structural changes? Tons of research on this. We've known for a long time that chronic alcohol drinking causes the brain to shrink. It kills gray matter, if you will. It kills nerve cells. And that can produce an alcohol dementia. So uh, alcohol is essentially a poison for your body. And there are some direct effects of alcohol, but indirects of alcohol. When your body's exposed to a poison, it elicits an inflammatory response. And the inflammatory response attacks its own cells, causing those cells to die. What's really interesting is that the recent research suggests that not just the nerve cells themselves get damaged by alcohol, but the tissue, the sheath that surrounds the nerve cells, the myelin, gets is very sensitive to the effects of alcohol. And it doesn't even take very much alcohol to cause damage to the myelin sheaths that surround the nerve cells. It's sort of, if you can imagine a nerve as being like the bare wire and uh, the sheath is like the covering around the wire. And if you lose all that covering, you're gonna get a lot of short circuits. So it's really important that you have that myelin sheath that helps the nerve function better. And that's very sensitive to the effects of alcohol. And it doesn't take very much. So recent data suggests that even small amounts of alcohol for men more than two drinks, for women maybe more than one drink, can cause at least temporary changes in the myelin sheath. Wow. It, uh, it can, used I to, you, can I ask you, interrupt and ask a question? Sure, that? absolutely. How does that relate then to disulfiram? Because disulfiram really slows down it's terrible. metabolism. It's yeah, it's got to be. A oh yeah, yeah. Medicine. So yeah, the the poison is actually acetaldehyde, and right. acetaldehyde increases because of disulfiram destroys the enzyme which metabolizes the acetaldehyde into less poisonous compounds, eventually carbon dioxide and water. And so if you take disulfiram and you drink alcohol, you're poisoning your body. That's exactly what you're doing. Yeah. So you don't want to do it too much because that will produce all kinds of terrible consequences. So the cell from when it works, it works better as a deterrent. So you don't drink, but God forbid, if you do drink on the cell frame, it's really bad for you. Besides yeah. feeling sick, it's terrible for your body. Right, right. Um, and I see Dave put it in the chat, but disulfiram is also known as ant abuse. Yes. Just, correct. So yeah. folks know that. Yeah. Not sure why that one's still FDA approved, but. Anyway, <laughs> well, it's interesting. In, in those days, when they approved medicines, you didn't have to go through the formal process of doing double blind placebo controlled trials. Right. I, if you have a minute, I'll tell you about a desulfiram study we did. Absolutely. Go ahead. So, we did a study compared people on desulfiram versus people who took a placebo. And there was a third group of people that we said, you're taking desulfiram, but in actuality, it was just such a tiny bit that it didn't really have any pharmacological effect. And then we looked at the results, and there's no differences between the three groups. But people said, the problem is you have to just look at people who are consistent with taking disulfiram. And so the data showed that if you were consistent with taking disulfiram, 85% of those people had a good outcome. And if you weren't consistent with taking it, it was only 15%. So people said, see, they saw Fram work. You just have to take it. So make sure you supervise the person and make sure they take it every day. And so is that a reasonable conclusion? 85% of people who take it have a good result. 15% of people who don't take it uh, have a good result. So most I, I know better say, than I, I, I know yeah, better I know, than to buy you know, the bait there. <laughs> what I'm gonna say. But so let's think about that for a second. It's not enough to compare people who take disulfram with people who don't take disulfram and say 
see it works better for people to take it. Because if you look at people who took a pill that they thought was disulfiram, they also had 80% success rates. And if they didn't take a pill they thought was disulfiram, they had 15% success rates. Okay. But even on top of that, people who took a placebo, I'm sorry, it wasn't even placebo in the study. We gave them a vitamin to take. So it isn't even going to affect your drinking. It is a vitamin. People who are consistent with taking their vitamins had an 80% success rate. And the people who didn't take their vitamins had a 15% success rate. So all it showed is that people who take their pill every day had good outcomes. It had nothing to do with disulfiram. And so that was a study that we did, not impressed with disulfiram. There's only one condition where I like to use disulfiram. And I'll tell you what that is. Sometimes patients come to me and they'll bring in their spouse and their spouse will say, that's it, I've had it. Um, I'm leaving, I'm done. <clears throat> and I say, well, wait a second, before you leave, I want to do an experiment. Here's a pill, disulfiram, and your spouse, if they drink, they're going to get really sick. But for this to work, you need to make sure, I need you there to make sure you watch them take the pill every day. But if they drink, they're going to get really sick. And so the spouse will say, oh, so you promise the person's going to get really sick if they drink. All right, I'll hang in there for that. <laughs> and so they, instead of leaving, they stay in there and they say, go ahead, drink. And so, so I use it at least as a temporary measure to get the spouse and the couple to stay together. And I give them naltrexone and they stop drinking and then there's a good outcome and they get together again. But so so in those situations, isulfiram is good because people say, oh, yeah, I wouldn't mind watching this guy get drunk and get sick. Yeah, screw him. OK, so 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 that now the punishment and re the conditioned response is on the other shoe or the other foot. <laughs> There you go. Exactly. Getting so, the reward for administering. Right. So the, so the spouse gets the reward by seeing their spouse get punished by drinking. Right. So right. that is an example of punishment supposedly reducing the, the frequency of a behavior. Punishment in general doesn't work that great, as it turns out. And punishment for alcohol drinking really doesn't work that great. So that's disulfiram. Okay. And while we're on medications, there was a quick question from Jean-Paul about the difference between nalmefene and naltrexone. So they're both opiate antagonists, opiate receptor antagonists. Um, they're doing a lot of research with nalmefene these days, and, and especially in Europe. And in Europe, they often use it in the targeted way. So they're using it as, in the Sinclair method way. Now, there's some companies in the United States that are thinking of bringing it to the United States. So it's going to be interesting. What's the difference pharmacologically? Not very much. Um, because naltrexone used to have the warning, don't take it if your liver enzymes are elevated because of those couple early studies that showed that high doses of naltrexone increased liver enzymes. The people who like nalmethine will say it doesn't cause liver enzyme problems. But I'm not sure if you did a direct head-to-head -head comparison, if you would see much difference. I think now Mephine maybe has a little bit of a longer half-life, so that could be an advantage. So do you think the, I think it's mostly we see now Mephine more in Europe than we would see. Yes, so that's where the study is. is. Yeah, is it just an artifact of the history? Yeah, yeah, it just, Europe uses more now Mephine, yeah. And I believe it's actually approved over there. Okay. Um. Karen had a couple of questions. Now, I think we have a bit of a technical problem here because I seem to have been signed out as the host. So, Karen, can I can't seem to unmute you, <laughs> uh, and or even to ask you to unmute. Okay, I think that worked. Okay, um, it works. yeah, good. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, I was just kind of chiming in, um, thinking about sort of the interaction between classical conditions conditioning and then what was the other one um instrumental and, learning yes instrumental learning yes um <clears throat> and just applying that to my own situation where i see that i you know am sort of changing my experience with the now where maybe i don't 
have the reinforcement that I did previously, but then there are these other changes. Like Dave mentioned that if I pour my beer into a glass, that might help. And so just kind of connecting, that might be the classical conditioning piece where like I have this can that I see and it clicks in my brain and it's like, oh, yay. Like I love that beer, you know? So, um, I guess it wasn't really a question, but more of like connecting the dots. So I appreciate all the information. Yeah. So it makes, hopefully makes sense that if you always drink out of the same can or the same color can, then your body will react to the can as if, oh, this is great. I'm going to get some beer now and it can increase your craving. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking about now, like, you know, including non-alcoholic beers in the mix. So like they look the same in the glass. Um, and, you know, so I don't have that sort of like differentiation where it's an automatic trigger. So yeah, not really a question, but more just um, a comment, I guess. Thank so, you. I mean, it, it raises the question though, that uh, if you want to effectively treat yourself, is it a good idea to do the extinction with the can so the can loses its condition oh, stimulus yeah. properties or to do mm -hmm. extinction in the glass so it may be then the can can it continues to have some condition stimulus properties and so if you run into a can future you might have some craving that you might not have otherwise oh but, yeah that so, is a great point and yeah interesting question <laughs> so i it's again it's just a question and but yeah. and the point is that if you see something that looks like the can and all of a sudden you have this thought, geez, a, a beer would hit the spot. Now you know what's going on by shining a light on it. Then you can say, oh, it's just classical conditioning. It'll pass in a little bit. I know what's going on. No big deal. Yeah. Yeah. That's a cool so. idea. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the beauty, really. And that's the purpose of this is to be able to get the tools to be able to examine our behaviors and say, Am I better with the can or am I better with the glass? I mean, because the answer could be different for each person, you know. Yeah. Uh, and and the glass versus the the can is probably a less complicated one. But when you start thinking about things like concerts or going to bars and stuff like that, where you have all these things happening, um, and I want to explore that just a little bit because the there's a couple of th a couple of themes here one theme is that constantly comes up is this idea that if you're taking naltrexone especially if you're taking it very regularly that all your activities are going to be flat and dull okay and we're here about myth busting and so i know you have some real interesting information about that and i think about that like in the context of going into a, a concert or a bar or someplace like that especially with friends that when you go into that kind of situation and alcohol is part of it and now you flattened it out by you know taking now trexone there's all kinds of other trans neurotransmitters like oxytocin that are happening there you know this enjoyment of just the company of other people and those things aren't blocked by that correct yeah absolutely i so could you elaborate on that please yeah so people will often equate pleasure as increases in dopamine and i'm not sure it's so simple as that that uh, as I understand how the brain works, there's numerous interactions between dopamine, endogenous opiates, serotonin, oxytocin. And for me, the brain works and pleasure works more like a symphony orchestra. You have a horn section, you have violin section, you have various sections. And an enjoyable symphony involves all the instruments and how they interact with each other. And even when they're not firing, I, I forget, someone said, uh, oh, you, you, you write the best notes. And the person said, it's not the notes, it's the space between the notes that makes music great. And, and so sometimes it's, it's not just hearing the horns going all the time, that would get boring, I think. It's that you have the horns, but then you have the strings and you go back and forth. And, and so for me, I think pleasure is much more complicated than just one neurotransmitter system. But the question of does naltrexone block 
reward. Um, it, it's something that I've been thinking about for a long time and something that we, when we did the original experiments, we wanted to study because we were concerned about that possibility. And so when I did the original studies, I had uh, questionnaires that asked people about a variety of pleasurable things to see if it would block it. And I found that it didn't. And compared to people who are on placebo, they did not have any less pleasure in things, except for what did they have less pleasure in? They had less pleasure for really non-chocolate sweets, non-chocolate sweets that blocked that a little bit. Yeah, I think you told me really super spicy foods. And I had one patient who loved Indian food and he liked really hot spicy foods like that brought tears to his eyes and he no longer liked that. And so normally your endogenous opiates are only released, not only released, but typically released when you experience pain. That's its basic physiologic mechanism. So it's not... The endorphins are not a key component of natural rewards. Um, but, but pain is a very potent stimulus for the release of uh, endogenous opiates. So any pleasure that involves pain, it probably does block a bit. So people who are ultra marathon runners, people who eat hot spicy foods, that sort of thing, it can block. Um, but the other thing about naltrexone that's important to keep in mind is that it's a competitive antagonist at the opiate receptor. So it doesn't completely block the receptor, but it binds to the receptors so that opiates, when they are released, they have a harder time stimulating the receptor. The net effect is instead of getting a rapid rise in endorphin activity, it's more of a gradual onset. And when there's a gradual onset, there's a gradual onset of dopamine. And so instead of getting that peak sort of euphoric effect, you get more of a nice, longer acting, pleasurable effect. It, it is probably the case that things that tend to be more addictive tend to have the effect of a rapid rush in something like dopamine, the, a quick change over time, which produces a nice sort of firecrackery, wonderful euphoria. But when that goes away, then you're left with sort of a rebound of, uh, Life is really boring. I'd like to get that firecrackers going again. As opposed to endorphins, um, when they're released naturally, give you more of a nice, warm, uh, fireplace kind of comfort effect. So you may get a different kind of reward, but it's a, probably a reward that's less likely to cause addictive behavior. But overall, people who are on naltrexone, most of the patients that I see who want to be on naltrexone say that life is better now because they don't have the alcohol around and, and they're able to engage in more social activities. They're able to enjoy their work more. They feel better physically. Great, great, super. Um, Gretchen had a question about what happens to the development of the brain if you start drinking very young, um, like... <laughs> me as a teenager or other people um as opposed to and so that's when the brain is in this like highly plastic state okay yes. it doesn't require a lot of concentration to um embed behaviors as opposed to someone who starts to develop an AUD let's say later on in life is it more stubborn to get rid of do you have to use different approaches what what can you say about that? Yeah, no, the developing brain is more sensitive to the effects of alcohol, and that could lead to more profound structural changes. So uh, theoretically, I, I haven't seen a lot of data on this, but theoretically, it can make it more difficult to recover. Um, and there are data that they, they call it early onset alcohol use disorder uh, patients who um, tend to have a, a, a harder course of recovery and actually tend to be good responders for naltrexone. So that's actually a predictor of a good response. So I, I, I was talking to a patient today who has a very strong family history for uh, alcohol use disorder. And uh, she said that uh, she fortunately waited until she was eight years old to start drinking. And she remembers with exquisite detail the first time she ever had alcohol. She was a uh, at a family function and uh, they had this big uh, punch bowl. And in those days they would put uh, uh, Hawaiian punch in the punch bowl and put vodka or some alcohol in it. 
and throw in a couple of scoops of sherbet ice cream. So you have to be of a certain age to remember this, but that used to happen at the these big uh, family parties and stuff. And she had it, and she goes, this was like the best thing she ever had in her life. She still remembers with fine detail the first time she drank, and it just produced a wonderful uh, euphoric effect for her. My God, you know, when you just told that story, that just reminded me of something of my childhood, okay? And I can't say that this exactly happened to me, okay? But I can imagine it did because I remember this instance happening. Cocktail hour is very common, okay? And having cocktail hour with certain drinks like Manhattans that would have cherries in them, Marciano cherries, and the uh, encouraging a small toddler to eat that cherry i i've seen it happen i gotta imagine it probably did happen to me um i can't even imagine what the effect of that is because that's powerful stuff yeah yeah I, baby brain yeah in in the years that i grew up there was i don't think we had seat belts or anything yeah but, but and certainly there's a pretty cavalier attitude toward uh, alcohol. So yeah, well, think, the uh, very earliest memory I have is looking, sitting on my mother's lap in a '53 uh, Buick and looking through the floor and seeing the road go underneath yeah. us. So I, I can relate to that. <laughs> so much for seatbelts, right? <laughs> oh, now it's you know I have to buy a special uh, uh, car seat. For my uh, grandchildren, it can't be just regular cars. It has to be tethered and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah. Uh, so I want to go back though to the. Uh, you made a comment that really is kind of explosive in a sense. You said that if someone has maybe a really pernicious uh, AD or one that has started at a young age, they tend to re respond to now more. Yes, that's really an optimistic and happy coincidence, or I don't know if it's a coincidence, but I mean, it's a happy outcome that, um, yeah, because normally one would think it's just sort of intuitive. You go like the worse the condition is, the more you need of medication to fix it and so on and so forth. And wow, you know, I mean, it's kind of the reverse is a it may be that because of the severity of it, that the response might be quicker and faster. Might, yeah. It might take longer to achieve, you know, the final outcome because of the persistence, but the initial response could be um, quicker. Be interesting yeah. to do a study of that. Yeah. I, is, we did a study looking at uh, medicine that affects serotonin and we found sort of the opposite effect that the early people early onset folks actually got worse on the serotonin medicine and the later onset people did better, but. Yeah. And I'm hoping, I think we probably will cover this later on, like in changing the paradigm and talking about other medications and stuff like that. There's a lot of interest in understanding more about like um, how SSRIs interact and so forth with AUDs and naltrexone and medications and so forth. Um, I think we've kind of tapped most of the questions that are out there. Um, looking here to see if there's anything else. If anybody has any other questions, now's the time to post them. Otherwise, we are just about almost exactly at our 90-minute time. I want to thank you so much, Joe. It's been very informative. Uh, again, just uh, we're so grateful for your time and your knowledge and your expertise. I think it, it's just it's helping so many people. Thank you very much. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Okay, great. We'll see you all next week then.